are a tap dancer. A damn good one. You are arguably the fifth best tap dancer in the world. But you want to know if you can do any better. You ask around your 100 person management team for ideas, and a voice pipes up at the back, Why don't you cut your leg off? As you're about to dismiss the idea as preposterous, a doctor pops up out of a nearby bin. Yes, you should do that. We're the best dancer in the whole world. No more shall tap dancing be tainted by all the dirty foreigners. You aren't convinced by this as being the best argument for self-mutilation, but clearly a number of your management team have thought about it a bit deeper than this doctor and are still in favour of it. So you decide to ask for some advice. You ask a number of choreographers, critics and theatre owners for their opinions, and the overwhelming consensus is that while it would be possible that you could improve your dancing by cutting off your leg, it would be significantly more likely to completely ruin your dancing career. You return with this information to those in your team supporting the removal of your leg, and they scoff at your report. What do experts know? Look at Pegleg Bates. He only had one leg and he was a brilliant tap dancer. Still sceptical about the idea, you decide to consult a doctor you didn't find in a bin. After getting an appointment with the head surgeon at your hospital, you raise the question of whether you should cut off your leg. Of course not. That's a dumb idea, comes your reply. But tell you what, why don't you ask your management team to vote on it? If they think it's in your best interest, I'll get your leg cut off. Immediately, your team burst into rigorous debates. On the one side, the racist bin doctor is gathering support, with rumours spreading amongst them of wondrous prosthesis made of multiple woods that would make different sounds depending on how you tapped it, and how you'll be saving £350 million on shoe costs. This number seems rather high to you, and you can't help but think that shoes seem a perfectly reasonable thing to be spending money on. On the other side of the debate, managers are looking through facts and figures, trying to calculate prosthetic costs and rehabilitation times, weighing them against the potential gains and finding them coming up short. You assess both groups, and come to the conclusion that those who support Lop It Off, uh, once you discount the overtly racist ones, seem primarily motivated by emotion. They've become fed up with theatres making the rules that seem to punish us while helping dancers from other nations. They see potential in a future where not having a leg is a selling point, and want to disrupt the status quo to realise it. Those who support Retain, however, seem more logically minded. They might be just as irritated by the rules as the Loppeteers, but can't see how the costs could ever be worth the reward, assuming there even is a reward. After getting your 100 managers somewhat organised, you pass around voting slips and tally up the results. 49 retainers, 51 Loppeteers. With a sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach you can only describe as unyielding dread, you announce the results to your management team. As the Loppeteers loudly celebrate, you distinctly hear the racist doctor loudly announcing, That'll show those dirty foreigners! As your eyes survey the crowd, you notice a hand raised at the back. Making your way over to it, you find a single member of your management team obliviously staring into the middle distance. Once you finally get his attention, he turns to you and asks, Quick question, what's a leg? You sincerely hope his was not the deciding vote. The next morning, after a breakfast mainly consisting of Loppeteers denouncing all that silly multi-grain prosthetic and shoe cost nonsense, a fact you can't help but feel probably should have been disclosed before the vote, you meet with the head of surgery again to tell him about the results. Ah, he says. I, um, didn't actually think Lopitoff would win. Oh dear. Well, I, I guess we'll need to arrange the surgery then. But uh, before that, I quit. Without pausing for breath, he marches right out of his office, out into the car park, jumps into his Ferrari, and speeds off down the road. After the remaining doctors quickly reorganise themselves, a new doctor steps forward to take charge of the operation. You distinctly remember her being a consultant on the retain side of the debate, but before you have time to question it, she starts yelling, Lop it off means lop it off, and her team strap you to a table. After thinking for a minute, she announces that the surgery team needs reassembling. While the majority of her team work for her in the United Doctors Union, she is dissatisfied with the number of Doctors United Union members in the room. After a quick reshuffle, several members of her team leave the room and several more opposing union members walk in. 
Never mind, it's fine, everything's fine, she screeches. Let's get the operation started. Given the complexity of the operation, the anesthesiologists have said they can give you two days to get the procedure completed. Confident in the time span she's been given, she signals to start the anesthesia, reaches down, makes a large, deep incision. Okay, now what? she asks, turning to her team. Well, clearly we need to cut off the leg above the knee, one voice pipes up. Don't you mean below? asks another. Knee? a third voice inquires. I thought we were cutting off around the ankle. The head surgeon signals to a medical student to go next door and work with the prosthetic designers to come up with a plan. For most of the next two days, all that can be heard from the planning room is loud arguments, the sound of furniture breaking, and the soft cries of the medical student. With only a few hours remaining, the door opens, and the 27 prosthetic designers walk out muttering, I'll have to do. The medical student, pale and sweating, quietly walks over to the head surgeon, hands her the plan with one hand, while the other picks up a scalpel from the table. God have mercy on my soul, he whispers, as he slits his own throat, an action that does not fill you with confidence. Ignoring the fresh corpse of the medical student at her feet, the head surgeon triumphantly reveals the master plan. You're no doctor, but it looks a lot like a drawing of a stick man with a line drawn down in crayon zigzagging all over one of his legs, by dissecting the genitals. A side note reads, to be reattached at a later date. You are most unhappy with this proposal, in part due to the lack of clarity about when and how your genitals are to be reattached. Right, here's the plan, let's do it, cries the head surgeon. Perhaps a fucking lootly not, comes the response. The other surgeons are as unhappy with the plan as you are, it seems. Oh, uh, then what about this one? asks the head surgeon, holding her first plan up again. That's the same plan, so no. How about now? No! Immediately, all of the doctors start arguing amongst themselves, each suggesting their own ideas. Amid all the noise, the head surgeon asks the anesthesiologists, Um, can you give us any more time? The anesthesiologist promptly sighs and looks over his machine. Okay, look. If you can agree on the head surgeon's plan, I can give you about four to six more hours. If you can't do that, I'll give you one. And you'll have to come up with a damn good case as to why I should give you any more than that. Unacceptable! screams the bin doctor from earlier, bursting into the room. That could mean the dirty foreigners are winning! If lop it off means lop it off, then lop it off already! He screams, brandishing a chainsaw. You are relieved to find this option garners even less support than the first proposal, and the extension time is agreed. While the doctors proceed to argue a lot and achieve very little, your gaze wanders over to the viewing window where your management team await. From what you can tell, they seem to be arguing as much as the doctors. While many seem to have stuck to their original views, many on both sides seem to have changed their mind on the subject. Also, some appear to have died and been replaced by new managers who would never have got a chance to vote the last time. You manage to get the attention of a nearby nurse and ask if she can find out what's going on over there. A few minutes later, they return with their report. Well, well um, I asked a few of them if they'd changed their minds, uh, and of the ones who had, more seemed to have switched from lop to retain uh, than switched from retain to lop. Uh, but I couldn't ask everyone, so I can't be sure that that holds true for the group um, as a whole. Also, it appears that a number of your theatre performances that you were scheduled to appear in are, uh, are being cancelled. This doesn't come as much of a revelation. If anything, it struck you as inevitable. However, you are surprised to learn that one of your management team, who is very vocal about the benefits of removing your leg, is the one cancelling your shows in his theatres. The nurse is kind enough to inquire on your behalf his reasoning on this inconsistency. Oh, it's nothing to do with your leg being cut off. It just makes more sense for my theatre to have two-legged dancers. But it's nothing to do with your leg being cut off. Sadly, the nurse does not agree with your suggestion to slap him in his stupid face. Before being called away, she does inform you that a lot of foreign theatre owners are showing interest in hiring you for their shows after your operation. At one-tenth of your usual fee, non-negotiable. With a sigh, you look down at your leg. It looks to you as though the initial cut could be treated fairly easily. Sure, there'll be a scar, but you'll still have a leg. You beckon over the head surgeon to inquire about the options. Well, yes, we could salvage your leg, comes the reply. But the will of the manager said three days ago they wanted to cut your leg off, so that's what we're going to do. 
You wonder if the managers could be asked again, citing the nurse's findings. Well, we can't keep asking the same questions over and over again. It'd be like saying that their answers last time didn't matter. You retort by pointing out that if their opinions didn't matter, you wouldn't be strapped to this bloody table in the first place, with a gaping leg wound. You continue by pointing out that a second vote could contain more detail than the first and make the doctor's job much easier. If you gave the management team all the options to choose from, they could rank them by preference, and the least unpopular option could then be selected as a viable compromise. This option seems to confuse the head surgeon, who takes a moment to try and process the idea. After a pause, she responds, No, 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 it would be undemocratic to keep asking the same questions, then turns away to ask the doctors for the fourth time if they want to go with her plan. It dawns on you that if they delay this much longer, that chainsaw will be your only option left. You take another look at the chaos that surrounds you. The doctors are arguing, the management team are arguing, your leg is still bleeding and starting to get septic. The anesthesiologist is looking at his watch and tutting. And to top it all off, the bin doctor is still muttering about dirty foreigners and has begun vigorously humping the chainsaw. As despair at your helplessness reaches new depths, you find yourself asking the same questions over and over again. How did we get here? Why was this allowed to happen? And how can this possibly end well?